parables. Jesus taught a great deal by parables. And uh, in preface to one of his parables, he said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Ears. The language of the Bible is replete with body language. Noses means anger. Eyes, as for us, means perception. Arms means strength. Hands means work. Fingers means delicate work. Ears means obedience as in the Arabic saying, which we all perhaps remember in translation from our days in the pantomime, going to see uh, Aladdin, because the genie in the lamp, if you rub the lamp, out jumps the genie who says, hearing is obeying, uh, and jump, jumps back in the, into the bottle or it is, and, uh, there we are. That, that's a, a nice example of the meaning of ears. So we have to listen to the, the parables and we have to figure them out, as the Americans would say. We have to think about them. They are designed to make you think. Well, this one that we heard this morning made me sweat all Saturday morning trying to think it out. It's a very difficult one to see, see precisely what it's all about. But I think the short answer is that it's a parable urging people to be ready, to be ready for whatever is bowled at them by life, to be ready. Uh, the context seems to be that the, uh, the, in the history of the state of Israel, because the books of the history of Israel in the Old Testament make it plain that Israel was not ready. They did not listen. They did not listen. And who didn't they listen to? They didn't listen to the prophets. And the end of their not listening, not being ready, was the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC, a horrendous destruction. Uh, the I have been and seen um, in, the, in the ruins in the, uh, uh, some of the burn marks which are, are there from that great destruction. Well, there you, you, you see in the, in the parable, and the, the king sent his, uh, his, um, his armies and destroyed that city when the people didn't go to his wedding feast and didn't to listen to his messengers, which is the prophets. Now, we know that Jesus regarded himself as in the line of the prophets, and therefore I think he's saying that this parable of the man who, the God who asks them to into a warm relationship as a wedding feast, who wouldn't turn down going to a lovely feast like that? But they, they, were, they were indifferent, and, and they turned it down and were rude, really, about it, and, and then uh, the next thing that we notice is that the, the first mistake of ignoring the, the invitation to listen is made worse because they dig their, the hole that they're in even deeper by ill-treating the messengers and eventually by killing them. So that is what Jesus said, that he is in the line of the prophets who were persecuted and even killed for their messages. Now that seems to be what's behind that and the key point I think in when, uh, when the church looked back on Jesus after the resurrection they saw that the, his, his prophecy was vindicated by the fact that Titus with the Romans sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD and from, from that moment on there was no more temple, no more uh, ancient state of Israel, and the Jews went into dispersion. Now, the, uh, there is a little rider to the uh, parable, which is more, even more difficult to understand. He noticed the king when he 
when he came into the wedding and he invited all sorts of people to take the place of Israel. That is to say that all of us Gentiles are now included in the invitation of God to be his people. Both bad and good, he fills his wedding feast. And he notices that one person there has not got on a wedding garment. Uh, that is very, uh, it, I have to assure you, it is not uh, a subtle insertion into scripture by Messrs. Moss Bros, Moss Brothers, who hire out wedding kits uh, in this country. Um, the, you know, the tailcoats and pinstripe trousers. Um, but then, of course, it is true that people like to dress up for, for weddings. I needn't tell the ladies present here that they like to do that. And hats become, uh, I suppose, if we did a modern translation of it, we'd say somebody turned up to the wedding not wearing a hat. Tut, tut, tut. Uh, there, there are rules and regulations about uh, dress. And dress is, of, of course, a very, a very interesting thing because it says things, it, it's connected very often with what you're doing. When I was an undergraduate here, we all had to wear gowns when we went to the university library. And all the dons had to wear gowns too. And there was something uh, quite interesting about putting on a garment before you went to do your reading. It somehow made you think, ah, this is something special. This is going to be important. So I put on my gown and I psych myself up to do a good job of work. And it's also true, of course, of Jewish worship. Uh, they, they have a talit, which goes over their shoulders and over their head, and it's kissed before you put it on just as a priest here in our church kissed a stole before they put it on, a mark of respect for some, the garment which you wear to do something very holy. And this sort of thing is another example, of course. They also, the Jews, have the, the, the uh, phylacteries, which are leather straps around their wrists, and a little box in which is written, uh, the first commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And a little box also on a headpiece which sits in front of your eyes, uh, which is another little box with the uh, Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So putting on clothes is not just a question of fashion. I think it can be, um, it can be an indication of the kind of work you're going to do and the importance of it. I, I think as a modern uh, piece of advice, I think it's probably best in general to dress up rather than dress down. When in doubt, I think it's better to be on the dressed up side better than the dressed down side. That's just a little throwaway remark, no extra charge. The um, Epistle now. The epistle is, talks about walking again. I think I've explained here that walking is, in the language of the Bible, walking means walking through life, behavior, ethics, in other words. So we are told to walk circumspectly, to walk carefully with what the Germans call Vorsicht, foresight, think before. Now, it's not an indication that you should, you should somehow not, uh, you should not trip over your feet or that you haven't t tied up your shoelaces properly. It, walking is behavior. So just like the great Psalm 129 is all about the law and all about walking in the path and the God who guides your feet. It's all about walking and the Hebrew word for that ethics is halakha, which means walking. And that's the name of the great tract tractate of the Talmud in Judaism, which is uh, laws and instructions. We are also to avoid drunkenness, wherein is excess. Uh, and it also doesn't help you to walk very well, does it? Uh, as perhaps some of us know in uh, secret moments. Um, uh, 
but it's, it, it puts you off the straight and narrow. And what in, in, instead of relying on that, you should rely on songs, uh, on psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing joyfully in, in your head to the Lord. So that there's a kind of buzz of, that you get from singing, if you really, like our lovely choir here, you actually working together with other people, it lifts you up. It has a, a great kind of uh, exhortation, a great kind of um, uh, inspiration is singing. And it's interesting that uh, singing seems to have evolved, church singing seems to have evolved from the Jew ancient Jewish and Arab uh, Muslim business of reciting the Quran or the scriptures which is done, as you've seen Jews doing it, they nod like this for concentration, and they are sort of ba 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 and th they always read aloud. And there's one of the church fathers who wrote, wrote to his parents and said, uh, dear mum and dad, I've just been to the great university in the great library in Alexandria, an enormous library, and I've seen the most extraordinary thing I saw somebody reading silently. So reading was always allowed, as it still is in synagogues or in shuls, in, uh, um, in places of learning. They, they are bobbing away and saying it aloud all the time. And they stand up to do it. Now that uh, kind of recitation merges and has, uh, merges into the beginnings of singing because the endings are always important. They always, you can, you can skim over the actual sentence, but the ending is always important. You have a, a song. Now that migrated to Rome and, and the Pope Gregory. We have the Gregorian chant, which is probably derived from the, this oriental business of reciting uh, the holy words uh, and with the endings. And to this day, books of Gregorian chant always distinguish between the chants and their endings. It's, it's always a, a monitor, mon monotone, no harmony, it must be. And it's very, very disciplined and wonderful to listen to. And that is what you should do as you walk through life. You should have these uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs buzzing around your mind, and that will keep you on the straight and narrow. Some thoughts on today's readings. The Lord be with you. <laughs>